The reading for tonight is from John's Gospel, chapter 19, verses 14 through 18. And please rise as we hear these words in Jesus' name. It was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about noon. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, Take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king, Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priests answered. Finally, Pilate handed them over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side, and Jesus in the middle. This is the word of the Lord. Grace to you and peace from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Three words stood out from our text tonight. Take him away. Three words that affirm the truth of what Isaiah had prophesied. He was despised and rejected by men. Take him away. Three words which show the truth of what Jesus himself had prophesied. The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. Take him away. Three words which show the truth of what St. John would later write in his Gospel. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. The roar of the crowds on Good Friday must have been painfully loud and terrifying. It would have been such a contrast to how things had been earlier that week, when on a calm morning, Jesus was walking with his disciples outside Jerusalem. When the city came into view for them, Jesus broke down crying and said, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Jesus went on to explain that a terrible judgment loomed over the city because you did not know the time of your visitation. Jesus had come to Jerusalem earlier that week on Palm Sunday, welcomed by shouts of worship and praise. But now he is sent away with shouts of anger and hatred, calling for his death. How could we even begin to explain why the people hated Jesus as much as they did? What had he done besides healing the sick, giving sight to the blind, driving out demons, feeding thousands? raising people from the dead, and most importantly, preaching the gospel of forgiveness. There was no evil in any of that. It was all only good. This is why Jesus explained to his disciples the evening of Monday Thursday, they hated me without the cause. There are many people in the world who would like to believe that people are naturally good, that we are born as clean slates, and that we are only shaped into being good or bad people by the environments in which we are raised. But that belief is not reality. Reality is what St. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8. The sinful mind is hostile to God. And there was never a day more filled with that hostility than when the people of Jerusalem called out for Jesus' death. Jesus picked up his cross, and he left the people to have what they craved. They craved his blood. But the reason for that was because Jesus was a threat, they saw, as an earth to the earthly peace and prosperity that they were enjoying. The Sanhedrin had said this about Jesus. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. The chief priests were the ones who, more than anyone else, should have been focused on ministering to God's people and helping them see how important their relationship with God was for them. But as our text for tonight tells us, the chief priests who were the ones leading the chant, we have no king but Caesar. Caesar, who in a generation would attack Jerusalem, kill, 
most of its people and destroy the temple. Caesar, who in a century would put down another Jewish revolt and completely destroy Jerusalem and build in its place a Roman city that the Jewish people weren't even allowed to enter. It's also so ironic that all these things happened at the time of the Passover, the festival of God's liberation of Israel from slavery. It's ironic, but it's sad, because in their craving for earthly security, the people chose servitude over salvation. And they aren't the only ones who have made this choice. Jesus tells us, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. But to that, the devil says to us, What kind of life is that? Did Jesus really say that? Get rid of him. You don't want that kind of life. And many times, the devil's words are the ones that we have chosen to follow instead of Jesus' words. So why is it then that we are not forsaken by God in exchange for all the times that we have forsaken him? The answer is that our salvation does not depend even a little bit on our devotion to God. Our salvation only depends on Christ and his perfect devotion in carrying out God's plan for our salvation. That plan had been so beautifully foreshadowed by the Passover festival. We remember how God had told the people through Moses to take blemish-free lambs and slaughter them. The blood of those lambs was then spread on the door frames of their homes, so that when the angel of death came to carry out the tenth plague, the blood of the Passover lambs saved the people from death. That was pure grace. The Israelites weren't any less sinful than the Egyptians were, but God had claimed them as his own. He had made them his people, and God delivered them from slavery. But an even greater delivery happened at Golgotha. There was blood again, but better blood, holy blood. There was the blood of the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. There was the blood that covers your sins and your guilt. There was Jesus' blood that is your righteousness. Through his blood, God has taken away your sins. He has removed them from you as far as the east is from the west, and he doesn't remember them anymore. Trusting in Jesus, washed clean by his blood, a glorious future awaits you. St. John was shown this vision, was shown this future in a vision which he records for us in Revelation. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. This blood, this forgiveness, and this future with God in heaven is what Jesus was carrying with him up the hill of Golgotha to fulfill his Father's gracious plan. About 15 years after these things, on his first missionary journey, Paul stopped at a church in, I'm sorry, a synagogue in Pisidia in modern-day Turkey. There, he preached about what had really happened on Good Friday. Those who lived in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not recognize him, nor understand the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled them by condemning him. And Paul would also write in Romans that the rejection of Jesus by his own people is what has brought reconciliation to the entire world. Take him away. Take him away. We shudder to hear these words. But we also know that at the trial where they were shouted, God was showing his grace and his power. He gave his son into death to pay for our sins. He used, he, he, he used his power to do what he does best, turning the evil that was spoken and desired into good, eternal good for all who trust in him. Amen. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding Guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord.
Amen.